right. Hey, good morning, everybody. It's Luke coming to you live on the podcast with Brendan, my good friend, fresh off his trip from Europe. He's got some awesome life lessons. Uh, we're just going to jump right in. Brendan, introduce yourself a little bit. Tell us about your trip to Europe. How's everything going? Yeah, what's up, guys? Luke, thanks for having me. Um, I had a blast last time, our last conversation. I think this one will uh, end up going a little differently, just with the direction that we went last time. But awesome conversation, and I'm really stoked for today. Um, like you said, just got back from my e Pray love trip, as my business partner likes to call it. Um, I was supposed to be in London for two days, and I turned that into a 60-day trip. Went through 10 different countries, first time in Europe, experienced a lot, um, a ton of hugs from God, as I've been calling it, which we can go into what I mean by that. Um, but yeah, it was an amazing trip and it's been super weird being back. <laughs> I will say like where I live is, it's like the most cookie cutter place in America. <laughs> and so coming from Europe, going straight into that, uh, it's been very interesting. So I've been battling with that a little bit, but I've also been traveling a good bit while in the States um, and working through making a decision on where my next home is. <laughs> so uh, that's fun as well. You even got to go to the best state in the union, Wisconsin, right? <laughs> Dude, Briefly. Wisconsin was freaking awesome. Yeah. I didn't even tell you about that. Like I had such an unbelievable, it was like the best week of my life. This lake, mm. the lake we were on, like top to bottom, the family was unbelievable. It was just like the coolest experience, bro. Like so unbelievable. Yeah, everyone hates on it because of the winter, but it's like, it's such a fun state. There's so much to do. There's so much great nature and like diversity. You can go mm -hmm. on lakes and go hi for hikes. And oh, I love it. I like to travel too, but yeah, it's, it's a cool place to be. Yeah. And we, we took, we took the ferry on Lake, Lake Superior, which was unbelievable. We went and like picked cherries and wineries and like, it was cool, dude. It was a really cool experience. Yes. So I know that you, you like to travel and everything. I think one of the most interesting things to me is you said, you kind of got prayed over and had a prophetic word about your, what your experience would look like and be. Can you tell me, can you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah. So I actually had a prophetic word my last semester, senior year of college said a lot of things <laughs> um, said I was going to go to Colorado, California and Switzerland um, that I was going to meet my wife on the travels <laughs> Um that I was going to be in the field of engineering, which at the time I was in finance and I was like, that's dumb. And then she went in to further explain, like not in the traditional sense of engineering, but bringing things together to make them run smoothly, which we know now that's like literally what I do for, <laughs> for a living. Um, so that was cool. And it's kind of just played out, as you know, with prophetic words, the more you listen to them in different seasons of your life, like different things are kind of highlighted. Um, so fast forward, I went and got prayed over a couple of days before I left. I was really scared <laughs> of my trip. And she said some really profound things, or I guess the Lord said some really profound things. Um, she said God was showing her this really long maze that I've been on. And she said I was right outside the center of the maze, which like wrecked me at the time. <laughs> and she was like, you know how the Bible says the wise man takes the narrow path. Um, God's saying you've already taken the narrow path and um, Europe is when everything kind of opens up for you. So that was really cool. Um, but she also said that I was going to see and experience and feel the Lord in the spirit realm much more than I have previously. How I'd be walking through the streets and I would just kind of know directionally where to go. I wouldn't have to worry about like being on myself, being by myself, not having a tour guide, stuff like that. And that's exactly what happened. Like the amount of, like I said before, I said, I called them like hugs from God. Cause that's what it felt like. The amount of like random compliments I got from complete strangers throughout this trip was like appalling. Like my biggest regret is not like recording them or taking notes about every time it happened. Cause it happened at least three times a day, things I've never been told in my life would just happen and happen again, happen again. Like it was kind of crazy. And then I would think back, how did I even get here? How did I end up at this coffee shop on this street and like backtracking? It didn't even make sense. I'm like, I'm, it's so random how I got to this spot 
and then ended up talking to this person that told me this, or I got to share this with them. And the whole entire two months was just packed with experiences like that. It was really cool. Oh, that's amazing. So do you think, you know, that it came like to fulfillment in your life that like everything kind of opened up in Europe? Is that what you think the opening up was referring to just the experiences with God and people? Yeah, it's a great question. I haven't really thought about that after the fact of what the opening up symbolizes. I think it's probably a complicated answer or complex with a lot of different pieces of the puzzle. Um, because I think like emotionally, a lot of things opened up. Like I felt like I just like, it was like an exhale for me. Um, I let go a lot of things in the past that I feel like maybe I was holding on to. Obviously you go across the world, a lot of the stressors, your everyday stressors are things that you put on yourself and those all dissipate <laughs> pretty quickly because you're just in a different environment. Um, which is kind of what Joel and I had talked about how important engineering your environment is. We talked about that last episode or um, last conversation, but sometimes I think going across the world or just picking a state and going by yourself, even if it's just for two days, like shaking your environment so abruptly and so drastically can really help a lot because it shifts your perspective to realize that a lot of the things you're like thinking about daily and worrying about daily don't even matter. Like you're just creating those things in your head. Um, so as far as what's opened up, I'll probably need to think on that a little bit. I'm, I'm grateful that you asked that because I haven't dove into that. Um, but I definitely think one thing I know is this is one of the things I wanted to talk to you about is this intuition question. Mm -hmm and feeling the sense of God or the voice of God was stronger than I've ever sensed in my life. And that is in itself kind of your, your mind opening up to new things and trusting in my intuition, which I think sometimes can actually merge in with God's voice and ends up being the same thing. Um, so I think that that's probably, or that's what comes top to mind um, as far as like what opened up for me on the trip. Hmm. Interesting. So do you think, do you feel like this was something that God led you to do to take this trip and to just kind of flow with it? Or is this something that you kind of felt led to do? And then, you know, God kind of was in it. I don't know if there's a strong distinction. Oh, no. there. A, th a thousand percent orchestrated by God for, okay. for sure. <laughs> like I really need to take the time to go and like write out and map out how all that came about all the things that occurred to even get me there in the first place and the things that went wrong in the, in the moment that ended up being right later on that allowed me to go. Um, but I know for like, it was just one coincidence after the next that kind of led to that point. So it was definitely an orchestration for sure. <laughs> yeah. The, I know uh, I've heard it said that coincidence is not a kosher word. Like it's, it's the God's yeah. providence moving in, in every moment. And, um, yeah. no, I think, I think that's really cool. Like when we're, I think us, well, I'll speak for, for us, us spirit filled types who, who seek God and believe he's active mm -hmm. in our lives and moving. I think sometimes we can get in like this rigid sense where he has laid out every single step of like one, two, three, turn left, you know, almost like he's like step-by-step step that way. But I think he's more flowy. And I think God kind of works with us as people, like he's empowering us to do things and he's still sovereign God over all of that. So he doesn't need to like make everything mechanistically happen. And like people think, oh no, I did, I did this. And I think God wanted me to do this and I got to step off and now I like ruined his plan. And it's like, no, I, I, he's not that fragile, <laughs> you know? So I think a lot of times he kind of opens it up and is like, hey, you know, if, if humans can design like what do they call them? Like massive online role-playing games where there's all this like things happening. God definitely can handle us being free and open and doing stuff and still be working in right. that with us, you know? So. Yeah. He chooses the playground, but he allows us to play around a little bit. <laughs> yeah. And I think, you know, to your question, you were talking about like, Hey, our intuition versus, you know, him speaking to us. I think the distinction I've kind of come to, and this is not like, 100% like 
scripture verse book chapter line i know this for a fact but as i think about it i think mentally like god designed all of us you know we have like our senses and i think we have this kind of i guess mechanism built in where we have this sort of intuitive um i guess mechanism inside of us that we're open to receiving this kind of thing and i think it's maybe biological maybe it's above biology so maybe someone might you know, term more in like the soul kind of realm. And I think what makes sense to me is that, you know, this is how we intuit between people that, hey, if someone's upset, you can walk in a room, you know, they're upset. Someone's like overjoyed, just giggling with laughter. And there's something inside of you that's like, oh my gosh, what's going on? I'm, I'm laughing too. I don't even know what they're laughing about, but I'm excited too. There's, there's something inside of all of us humans, right? That we have this sort of sense and it plugs us into something that's just beyond our our five senses. And I think God speaks into that. You know, I think his voice kind of uses that mechanism and interacts with that. I don't know if it's like super clean or if I have, you know, definitive proof, but to me, that just kind of makes sense based on my observation. Like, what do you, what do you think about that? I think that's beautiful. I've never thought about that, but I sense that, like, I felt that, that to be true. <laughs> um when I thought about the difference between intuition and hearing God's voice or God speaking, I feel like it starts like this. And the the more of a relationship you develop with God, the more he comes to, to know you better. And the more you come to learn him better, those things start to merge. And I don't know if they're actually apart at the beginning or if they're always together and it's a confidence thing. Because this is a fine line between like having to feel righteous, but being righteous. And I feel like the more I seek God and and do live a righteous life, the more confidence I have in my intuition, which feels like it's more aligned with God speaking. Like I trust it more. So I don't know if they start separated or if they're always together. And it's just, you know, the more I seek God, the more confidence I have in trusting that. Or if they really do start apart, and then as you come to know God and God comes to know you, those things start to merge together. Those are mm. two different perspectives I'm playing around with. Oh, Does I that think make that's, sense? Yeah, that's right on. I think, so when I do coaching with people, one of the, the good questions we ask is, what is the gap between your awareness and your experience? And usually the greatest gap between your awareness and experience is something that's like a gap where someone's frustrated, like, hey, I know I should be X, Y, Z or doing, but I'm not. So then that's kind of the space right. where we work. And I think you're right that I don't know if there's necessarily a gap. And I think that's like a good, good thing you're working with. But I think, like you said, maybe the gap is more in mindset and confidence of, hey, this is allocated to us once we were connected to God, you know, it says we're the righteousness of God Mm -hmm. and Christ. We're in Jesus. Like that's there, (laughs) you know? Yeah. But I think it's just like, Hey, do I trust this? Can I use this? And it could be a cultivation thing. Like, Hey, you got to work with it. Yeah. Do I trust this? And can I use this? And the, yeah, just like you said, it's an experience thing too. Like the more I did it in Europe and the more it quote paid off, like, and the more I was able to look back and be like, Holy crap. Like I just trusted this and ended up here and this happened the more prone I was to just like really like sit in that and be still and wait for that intuition to kind of guide me, which I think is a beautiful thing. And what I've experienced now being back, things are a lot louder. There's a lot more noise around. And so it's harder to sit in that because I'm not by myself 99% of the time. But I sense the intuition just as strong in business, but I don't follow it as quickly. I'm like Hmm. quick to just be like, oh, that's a feeling. What's real? Whereas when I was in Europe and I was traveling and I was just experiencing things, I would sense it and then I would just go there. There was no delay. And so I just recognized that within the past couple of days, like when I'm dealing with business, should I be working with this person or should we go after this deal or um, what type of strategy should we build out for this client? That intuition is still there but I have like some weird barrier against it right now within business, just business, Hmm. which is interesting that it's different. Hmm. It's like a block. 
That's interesting. I think you're right. Like it's kind of cultivating that skill set and you got a lot of reps and familiar with it. Can you tell me like, what do you think is like, tell me about this block. Like, is this okay to talk about it? Like, I'm just curious. It's like, it's so interesting to me. Yeah. Well, I thought, so the first thing I go to is maybe that's a fear that I have of giving God full control over that part of my life. <laughs> maybe I'm, I'm comfortable giving him control of where I go to eat and what coffee shop I go to work at and what person I talk to, (laughs) but I'm fearful to give him full control over what clients I work with Hmm. and what business strategies we implement unawarely. But now I realize that like, that's the only thing that makes sense to me. Interesting. So it might be, one thing that kind of sticks out to me too, though, you mentioned like, hey, there's like the trust in the the skill part of it. Another factor that might be involved, and you tell me what you think of this, you had kind of mentioned environmental. You know, like, hey, in Europe, there's less noise. There's just very different context for not only yourself, but the people you're interacting with and how you're like, you're out of your routines. You're saying like, yeah, your morning routines. Now it's kind of different. That whole like context and the environment kind of shapes your interaction with it too. Do you think it might be something with that as well? Yeah, a thousand percent. I also think I'm being called out of the season of life as far as where I live. Um, I'm being called into a new season and a new place. And I'm just experiencing the negative effects of dragging that out, like sticking in the place I know I need to leave. Um, That's why I'm taking next steps. I'm literally going to our apartments like in a couple of weeks. So um, I think that has a potential to be one of the main things as well. (laughs) Gotcha. Yeah. There's always tension in transition (laughs) between seasons and areas of life. Yeah. uh, One of the things I read daily is um, I long for the things I must grow to obtain. I do not long for the things that I've outgrown just because they're familiar. Hmm. And I think that pertains a lot to our environment as well we're so used to a certain environment that we grab onto it and we think that that's going to be long-term, but sometimes we have to look at that. Where's that from? That's really interesting. I have to look that up. Um, it's in my morning formula. I, it's a huge blur on my morning formula as far as what is directly from Taylor, what I've pulled from other lessons and created oh. of my own, what I've developed solely on myself. I don't know. It's a blend of all the above. So it, it, it could be any of this. I'm not it's sure. like a quote from somewhere though. Interesting. Yeah. That's fascinating. But I love it. It's super impactful. And I'm, I quote it a lot, like with friends when they're like, whether they're talking about relationships that they know they need to get out of, like that's when it's very useful. <laughs> But it's mm-hmm. useful for a lot of things because I think that's one of the most common themes I see when I'm talking to like friends or clients or, you know, even Joel. Like so often we cling on to things just because they're familiar mm-hmm. and it's almost a crutch. When a lot of times the things that used to serve us in the past season no longer serves us today. And it's really important to recognize that. Yeah. I think that is so I remember true. we got pushed, we got pushed with, Taylor in one of the meetings that like that might even pertain to some of our routines routines that have got us to this level of success morning routines daily routines the way we structure work models frameworks within what we do for consulting just because they got us here doesn't mean that they'll always be um, useful in the next season of life we have to constantly be taking audits of that which is very interesting Mm -hmm. yeah I really I always respect that about Taylor too that he's like the guy who innovated a bunch of the models that you know, a lot, a lot of leaders in the space copied and, and uh, allocated for their own. Yeah. And he has the courage to be like, oh, yeah, all well, that's broke now. That, that, that's, that's three years ago, dude. That's, you know, I was like, yeah. Oh, and that's broke. when it's, that's the easiest. I think that's the easiest example for people to understand is like business models. Like everyone knows that doing like if you think about marketing and advertisement, mm. Facebook ads crush. Like, you know, 2008, 2009, all the way to what, like 2014, 15, and then things started to shift. And now you can't just dump a bunch of money into Facebook ads and get the return that you used to. Like, it's way different. 
even with sales, like we did the whole paint hell island, paint heaven island, bridge the gap. Like that's all going away. Things change and it's easy for people to understand that. But when you re- when you relate that to life and things that are outside of business, it's a little harder to understand, but I think it holds perfectly true. Like your morning routines or relationships that you have with friends or business partners. Sometimes those things were pivotal in getting you where you are in this level of success, Mm -hmm. but you have to recognize new seasons call for new things. Yeah. I think that's one of the hardest things of life is to, to build rapport with people well, to grow together, but then also to have the self-respect and like the love for other people to be willing to realize and say like, Hey, this was great for what it was, but we're both growing and change needs to happen and it's best for both of us even if we can't do it together and that is so hard like I've seen that in several areas of my life like even in church and business it's like I love you enough to like end this well (laughs) and unfortunately not everyone wants to end things well and it can be messy but it's like I think that's where kind of grace comes in and like the I guess the intuition and like spirit of God moving in our life to be like, we're still going to end this. Well, you know, it's like, Oh man. So what do you think? You think that's true? Like the ending part is difficult. Sometimes you got to rip the bandaid off. Yeah. Depends on if we're talking with people, if people are involved then it's different, if it's not people and it's just, you know, some arbitrary thing in your life that you just, it's not serving you anymore. Just rip the bandaid off. Yeah. Very true. Which I'm like, I live in the gray, dude. So I'm good with that. Like if I, once I recognize it, I'm like, I'm good. It's changed, whatever it is, what it is. Like one of my favorite things to say, and I think my friends get aggravated. I'm like it is what it is. <laughs> I think I want to get that tattooed on me. Cause it's like, I say it so much. And I think it's so important. Like with the, you can only control the things you can control. And a lot of times the things that we get most upset about, aggravated about, annoyed about is the things we can't control. And a lot, my greatest answer and i think the best way to move forward is it is what it is now what like what do we do next (laughs) Mm -hmm. well i think i think you're absolutely right like and this is a tool that i've used and i don't remember if we talked about this last time but my brother and i came up with this as we were kind of having a coaching conversation is a lot of times in life we can say that yes we agree with everything we just said um but applying it in real life is kind of hard like when we're trying to grow to another level you like one telltale sign is that your superpower at the last level is going to be the anchor that holds you in that level. And you're going to try to bring that mm-hmm. with you. And it's like, yeah. Oh, that sounds good. But it's like, no, really look back in the last season. It's like, this was the best thing. Like I was the best at this. And it's like, yeah, that's the thing you now need to let go of. <laughs> Cause that superpower is the anchor that's going to hold you back from going into the next season. It's like, Ooh, that kind of hurts a little. I don't like that. <laughs> Yeah, that's so good. And it relates to something I think a lot of as well. Like as I get older and I'm I'm still young, so I know people get annoyed when I say that, but like as I mature, I realize that success in its most general sense, not just financial success or business success, is more about removing and and less about adding. Mm-hmm. Whereas when I was younger, I always thought I need to what you do, like acquiring skills is super important and you need to add on things, but I always like felt like I needed to gain all of these things to be successful and now I'm realizing it's a lot more just removing the fog like you just have to like knock the cobwebs out of the way and that's how you get closer to that success bubble for sure have you read uh Benjamin Hardy's Dr. Ben Hardy and Dan Sullivan's book 10x is easier than 2x (laughs) it's in my it's in my queue I've heard so many good things about it yeah it's it's genuinely an outstanding book. And that's kind of one of the core principles in it is that it's not about adding. He's like quite the opposite, like to, to grow, to achieve, to be who you're supposed to be. The problem is people think like, oh, I can add on a few things in the margin. Or even if they'll take what you say, like, hey, I got to remove some stuff. They're like, oh, I'll mess around with some of the things here and, you know, mix up my morning formula a little bit, or I'll add cold plungers or take them out. And he's like, nah. It's not the, that 20 little percent. He's like, you need to cut out 80% and it's going to be gruesome. Mm-hmm. Like cut out 80% of that 
and then go into that 20% and see what is actually working. Like you got to cut out so much and it's going to be good stuff too. Like the good stuff is what's going to hold you back from being the best, you know? And it's like, yeah, he really talks That's through what, it. That was Europe. That was Europe for me because it, it was inevitable. Like that just happened. I didn't have to do that. The 80% was removed for me. Mm-hmm. And I experienced the 10 X while I was there because I was working way less and getting way more done. I'm like, how is this possible? <laughs> so like that, that really was a lesson I didn't even think about until you just said that it was forced upon me, which is cool, which is maybe a lesson for people listening, like get out of your environment every once in a while, shake things up. It'll help you gain that perspective. If you shift your perspective, if you shift your location <laughs> for a weekend or a week and go work somewhere else, you'll realize quickly what's necessary and what's not. Mm-hmm. Then I think the real challenge is people can do that. But then when you return to like your regular environment, the challenge is like, hey, you experience this increase in capacity. Are you going to go with that and honor your experience and like the God's moving in your life, all that influence? Are you going to honor that and then make the change and cut out that 80%? Or are you going to go back to the to the regular, you know? It's not easy. Yeah, either, and that's what just... I I struggled with that the week before I left, and I've been struggling with that ever since I got back because I don't even know how to like verbalize this correctly because a lot of times it'll make me sound like an a hole. <laughs> but while I was out there, I was so I was just by myself, right? And like the people I talked to was like you know my closest friends, like maybe two or three, my family, my sisters. Joel, you know, very select group of people. And I realized that's all I need. And not only is it all I need, it's the only, it's all I want. I don't want anything extra. And so I was terrified to come back because I was like, I don't care about 99% of the things I cared about before. I don't care to see the people I was seeing daily. I don't care to talk to them, to check in how their day's going, which you know me well enough to know that's not me. Like I'm such a people person and like, I want to interact with every person I come across and try to make their day. And so that was like this really hard thing for me to think through in my head. Um, So I'm still balancing that is like, what am I being called into? What is God pushing me into? And what part of that is positive? And what part of that am I just being an a-hole and wanting to like be by myself and individualistic? (laughs) And it's been really hard. I haven't figured it out yet. But like experiencing that for a while, being by myself, I was like, wait, I don't need any of this. Hmm. Which is funny because um, Matthew McConaughey was on, I think it was Lex Friedman, one of the podcasts he did through his little tour he just did recently. And he was talking about how he did Dazed and Confused, got all that that quick fame from, from that first scene. And uh he went to his agent and he's like, Hey, I need a manager. And he said, Matthew, you need too much. What you need to do is you need to go to Europe. You need to get on a bike and you need to travel for a couple months until you don't need it anymore. Mm-hmm. And so that's what he did. He literally took a motorcycle through Europe for a couple months, backpack, came back, didn't even ask for a manager. Within two days, his agent called him and said, I got a meeting booked for you. And he had a manager in the next couple of days. <laughs> Cause he didn't, he's like, I didn't need, I didn't need anything. And I was like, I hung on to that. Cause I love Matthew McConaughey and he's so freaking cool. But like, I experienced that. Like that was the exact thing I felt. I needed a lot of things too much. I needed new clients. I needed new relationships. I needed all these things. And then when I went there and that all went by the wayside, I didn't need anything. And the things that I was looking for before started to come into my life. <laughs> it's pretty wild. <laughs> That's so true. That's like, that always reminds me of the pruning, pruning aspect of it. You know, and we're in like the neediness. Mm-hmm. It's things that are pulling away from us. You know, it changes our state when we're in a state of neediness. And it puts us in kind of like a weird, a weird state. That's the right way to put it. But like one of my favorite little books, and I just recently gave this to a friend, is called Secrets of the Vine. It's by the guy who wrote okay. The Prayer of Jabez. It's super short, but he talks about like big grape vines that produce, you know, like grapes for wine and stuff. And essentially he like has this real life experience where he bought a piece of property, he had a vineyard, there's this big vine and it's shared with a neighbor. And there's this big, beautiful green 
you know, vine full of grapes. And he's like, oh, cool. And uh, the next day he like walks out and his neighbor is just murdering this bush. Like every bit of green on the vine is gone. And he's like, what are you doing? Like, don't you like grapes? And the guy's like, oh yeah, I love grapes. Like, yeah, that's, and he doesn't understand. Like he eventually, that's like kind of the lesson he learns through the book is like, yeah, all like the, the good things, all those green branches, he had to cut off because that was pulling. That's like the needy, all those branches of green stuff needed mm -hmm. stuff from the vine. But that's what's going to hold it back from producing this beautiful fruit. So I always love that like story. It's so powerful. It is powerful. And I, I experienced that for the first time when me and my ex-girlfriend split up after the three years. Because right literally the weekend after it was like god said finally you made room for me to move <laughs> and i feel like that's so powerful a lot of times like we especially like the go-getters the entrepreneurial type that we are we always like adding those things in and then we're praying and being like god why aren't you moving in my life and it's like dude there's no space <laughs> you got to make space um and there's sometimes it's a lot more painful to make that space when you have to make really tough decisions sometimes you can jump to europe and it happens for you <laughs> but i think it's a little bit of both um but it's really important to like remove those things go through the pruning process often mm -hmm. and taking audit on you know what's required but again i the thing i am still wrestling with is like the things i don't feel like i need anymore i don't want that to turn me into an a-hole where i'm just like i don't care about anyone even though i do feel like that I'm like i'm not I'm not worried about anybody or any of the conversations that I used to like care about before. <laughs> Do you want to talk about that? I'd like to get your thoughts. Yeah. So I recently went through some really big transitions myself. So I'm a hundred percent in this with you. And I think the hardest part for me is like when we let things go, it can seem like, oh, did you not like that? Or did you hate that? Or was it bad? And it's like quite the opposite. Like I've had to let go of some really good things, like things I loved and was passionate about, invested in. And like going through the processing of that, like I had an experience where I was really like almost like grieving it when I had to let go mm. to walk in and in obedience. Like it wasn't me. Like I just want to leave and I'm upset. It was something that God was calling me out of and I had to be obedient in. And I was like upset and God spoke to me. He was like, there's a cost to disobedience. Like part of me was like, oh, I did it wrong because it hurt and it didn't feel good. <laughs> and he's like, there's a cost to disobedience. And he's like, there's a cost to obedience too. And it was almost like I had like, oh, I messed this up. So I like all this is a loss. And he was like, no, no, no. Like obedience, there's a cost to it too. But it's like an investment, like that good thing you're giving up is now like dedicated to him. Like we put it on the altar and it's not lost. It's like a sacrifice given, you know? So the, the hardest thing I realized is I can have an it's attachment. Yeah. Like I can have an attachment. Like I need to keep this, but like you said, if, if I'm giving it up and releasing that like attachment to it and the neediness, it's probably a right word for that. And like the things I perceive that it could give me, if I'm willing to entrust that to God, invest that and like give it up, that's honoring him. But then also it's honoring, like I'm doing what I'm supposed to do in life and not just following my own blind, like ambition and desires of, I want this, I need this, this is for me and I can control this. Like you said, Hey, I'm, a, I'm in Europe and I'm feeling free and being led and everything's like, Oh, this seems wrong. Oh, actually that was like the coolest thing. Like <laughs> that made my day. And this is the coolest experience. Like we can expand that out. And like, I've had this, I've been walking in this for a few weeks too, where it's like, okay, now I'm in this new freedom. It still hurts. I'm still missing some of that stuff, but now I'm opening myself up. Like I've, you know, like the song, make room, I'll make room for you to do whatever you want to and take do whatever you down want these to. walls, you know, and everything. It's like, that it's a whole different so experience. Good, dude. Oh. I don't necessarily have like an answer, but I know I'm, I'm open to it. And like, I'm in, I'm in a mode of like, I trust you. Things don't have to work out the way I want them to. I don't have to keep all my stuff, but I know that I'm in line with you and we're good if we're together. So mm -hmm. Does yeah, that does that mirror good. your experience at all? 
Yeah, and I prefer that perspective than the guilt that I feel letting things go previously, you know? Again, I think a lot of it, a lot of this goes away when I move. <laughs> it's just like the, the physical place that I'm in has a lot of these like negativities to it that I feel like that was one of the biggest things. I, I went to Europe and I felt like I was being pulled upwards for the first time in my life. Whereas like where I'm at now, I come back and I feel like I'm constantly being pulled down. Like I'm swimming upstream instead of downstream. And so I think instead of getting frustrated, I just re I need to just recognize that that's a sign to change that, <laughs> to pick a new river <laughs> that I could swim downstream. Yeah. Well, I, I totally, I just want to say I recognize that in you. And that perspective is powerful. And a willingness to look at that for what it is, I think that's a strength that you have. So I just want to say I honor that in you. And, you know, I was kind of looking at that dichotomy too. Like God spoke like, hey, there's a cost for disobedience, but there's also a cost for obedience. And I think what helped is I kind of looked at the opposite. Like there's a cost for walking in the new and giving up and letting go. There's also a cost like, hey, if I stay where I know I'm not supposed to be, um and do what i know i'm not supposed to do and then i'm living in myself misaligned discordantly not doing what i'm supposed to do and that creates something in me too like i'm not only i'm going to show up differently for the people that i'm supposed to be helping or i could oh i'm staying because i love and care about them and i'm helping them it's like no no you're not and even if you were now you're showing up inauthentically and you're not doing like you're in disobedience and misalignment are you really showing up and helping all these people powerfully and i'd realize i'm like no that's not that's not a good look like am i doing this for my own comfort that's not a good look you know that's not really honoring god or even honoring what he's supposed to be what he's doing in my life you know so that's kind of like i had to to balance that out with something too if i'm only looking at one side of this equation so, and it's not easy and I'm not saying like, oh, it's a real simple, easy decision to make for anybody, but I think it's the truth of the matter. So. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, there's a lot. <laughs> so much change over the past couple of months, dude. It's been crazy. I'm like ready to settle, settle down a little bit, take an exhale. I'm still about to travel for another month, so that's not going to happen, but hopefully <laughs> in the next couple of months. Yeah. Well, I'm thankful. He always gives us rest. Like, there's always a period of rest. There's there's climbing the mountain, but then sometimes it's the slow walk down the mountain into the, the gentle valley. That's There's good, good in there, too. Yeah, for sure. It's a very short period. You get to look at the top of the mountain, too, for a couple of minutes before <laughs> yeah. you descend. <laughs> Yeah, just hang out there for a while, taking the view, right? Yeah. So I guess that's my last question for you. You know, you've had kind of this this cool experience. You're going through these changes. You've got this like this cool perspective. Like, do you have any advice or big takeaways that you would want to share? Like one last gem of wisdom from from where you are and what you've been through for for us. I think the biggest thing is that that stick out to me is one, the importance of engineering your environment in a way that's going to propel you forward. Um, and that can look a lot differently for different people. You know, obviously some people are not in a position to go up and leave and go to Europe for two months, <laughs> but I think it could be done in a much simpler way than that. It's just being aware that your environment plays a massive role in every aspect of your life. Um, and the other one is, is seeking God and allowing God to learn you more about you because that the confidence that comes from that in, in your righteousness is so beneficial to lean into that intuition. Um, that's the biggest takeaway for me is like, I saw the benefit almost multiple times a day of leaning into the intuition on the small things, right? Like the little bitty things that I keep bringing up, like the right coffee shop to go to, or like whatever it is, like which museum to skip and which one to actually go to. Like it was very small things, but it was obvious that I was leaning into my intuition and that it paid off. 
And so now that I'm back home in my previous environment, continuing, continuing to lean into that, I think is really, really important. Um, so yeah, engineer an environment that uh, propels you forward and seek God because he's really dope. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's perfect. <laughs> well, thank you very much, Brendan. Where can people find you? Yeah, so our website is the uncommonproject.co. That's Joel and I's company. Um, we basically help early stage startups go to market. And then I'm on Instagram and LinkedIn mostly, uh, just Brendan Hitzman, my name. Awesome. We'll link to that in the show notes and hopefully we can get Joel. I would love to, to get, yeah. <laughs> add to this show too. That'd be fun. So sweet. All right. Thanks awesome. everybody. Thanks, yeah. Have a good day, you guys.